The Panther was the pride of the Littlefield collection. You may have been familiar with this vehicle from seeing it on the TV show Tank Overhaul. However, at the time the show was filmed, the vehicle's restoration had not yet been completed, so now is as good a time as any to have a look at this masterpiece of restoration. The vehicle itself was completed just prior to Mr. Littlefield's death to cancer. Uh, he did get to drive it, and it is his crowning glory. The search to develop a replacement for the Panzers III and IV started in 1938. The brief the engineers were given by Inspectorate VI, the department in charge of acquisition, was actually very broad. It simply said, make it better than the previous tanks and don't make it over 20 tons. As a result, the engineers were free to start developing new technologies which eventually found their way into the Panther. By 1941, though, it became obvious that a 20-ton design just wasn't going to cut it. Uh, amongst the improvements, a bigger gun. Now, it wasn't that the bigger gun was absolutely critical. Uh, the 5cm 60 was actually proving quite capable of killing T-34s, but there was also a morale effect. Guderian pointed out that as long as at least some of the guns in a Panzer Red Pylon were capable of dealing with the KVs, the crews would feel a lot more confident. This is an effect I've noted with Sherman as well. Warfare is as much a battle of wills as it is whether or not you can actually kill each other. In fact, probably more a psychological issue. In any case, the other factor with the larger guns that were being seen on the battlefield was that it was about time the Germans thought to start putting more of a slope onto their armored vehicles. It came down to a choice between two manufacturers, Daimler-Benz and MAN. The Daimler design, the VK30.01D, was effectively a Teutonic T-34 with interleaved road wheels. The MAN design was a little bit more complicated, and they weren't entirely sure how well it would work out. Hitler thus approved the Daimler-Benz design for production. However, a special commission was set up to really thoroughly investigate the two designs a little bit more, and they convinced Hitler unanimously uh, to change the decision that the MAN design was better suited for the German situation, not least because it didn't have to wait around for the production of the turrets and motors. And thus, Panther was born. It had a fairly inauspicious start to its career, a lack of reliability being chief amongst the problems. Over time, the design was changed a little bit, the initial model Aus D being replaced by the Aus A with uh, Panther number 831. The A model was basically an all-new turret installed onto an effectively unchanged D. And the vehicle behind me is an A. We'll do this, of course, the usual manner. Exterior first, hull and turret, and then we hop inside and we get to see what the crew got to play with. The front of the tank is where it got its reputation for armor. Eight centimeters at the top, six down below. Although by the time the Panther A's were in production, they were no longer being face hardened. Detail points, only one headlight now, as opposed to two on the earlier versions. You can see the front part of the side hull plate, four centimeters thick, and you can see the eyelet used for towing. Now, unfortunately, in order to get your clevis or whatever you're going to use in, you actually have to remove the front fender. So there are the wing nuts up at the top here, which is convenient enough. Unfortunately, they seem to be regular bolts down here. Once you have this off, you can then attach your tow hooks, tow ropes, what have you. Moving a little bit further in, the driver's direct vision port eventually was removed, but obviously by the time this vehicle was built, it was still being used. Earlier Panthers had a, what they called the letterbox machine gun port. The, about partway through the A-series production run, they replaced that with the more familiar ball mount. But because the ball mount actually has a optical sight of its own, that meant that they removed one of the periscopes that the radio operator had to him. Outside of that, let's uh, hop around to the right and we'll have a look at the suspension. Moving down to the running gear, we'll start off with the nice wide tracks, 66 centimeters wide in fact. There are 86 links per side and they are held in place, the single dry pin track links, by a retaining clip and a little spreader pin. There is one return roller or support roller on this tank. A lot of people will miss it. It is right behind the sprocket wheel up here. And as near as I can tell, its primary function is actually to stop the track from folding in on itself when the tank goes in reverse. 
uh, for going forwards it doesn't seem to be all that necessary although perhaps it does help with the feeding onto the teeth the wheels 16 road wheels per side interleaved this is an example of an engineer's dream and a tanker's nightmare now the theory is simple enough in order to spread the weight of the tank over as many axles as possible, you need to have as many wheels as possible. That reduces single point pressure. In order to keep the tank easy to steer, not too long, you need to reduce the length of the ground contact area. Finally, in order to get the wheels to go easily over bumps of various different sizes, you want to have nice big wheels. Well, pretty much the only way you can get big wheels in a short contact area is going to be if you start overlapping them. Hence, this design. Now, and it worked. And technically speaking, this was fantastic. You have a look at a Panther going over the bumps on a test track, the, the thing is beautiful. The problem is from the perspective of the end user. Problem number one. Let's say I want to replace this road wheel back here. In order to get at that, I got to pull off this one, both wheels here, and both wheels on the bogey behind it. And this is all unsupported track, so every time you pull a wheel off, you've got to have a couple of lads with tanker bars lifting up the track to, to get the wheel off. Secondly, and I'm, granted I haven't seen primary evidence, but it does make a bit of sense, the wheels are all close together, mud will get caught between them, and if it's, say, a cold winter's overnight, the mud would freeze in between the wheels, which meant that when you woke up the next morning, you had to either melt the mud or break it apart with a pry bar. Now, granted, you probably need a heck of a lot of mud in order to overwhelm the power of a tank in low gear. But that said, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. The bogies themselves, uh, the inner ones are also the ones which are primarily used for the guide horns. There are two horns on each track lane. The road wheels are mounted on arms attached to double torsion bar suspension. Now, the road wheel arms on this side are all trailing arms. The road wheel arms on the left side of the tank are all leading arms. I guess it's simplified production. I can't think of any tanks after World War II which had this design. On the Russian front, Panthers are being lost by 14.5 mm rounds punching through the 4 cm thick side armor of the lower hull. As a result, a program was started to develop a new, tougher tank, the Panther II. However, somebody had the bright idea of just putting soft steel skirting on the sides of the hull and to see if that worked. Well, they tested it against a 14.5mm rifle, they tested it against HE rounds, and it did indeed provide proof against those weapons. It was not initially designed or tested against shaped charge rounds, contrary to a fairly common misconception. As a result, because the Schurzen protected the side hull upper, and the road wheels protected the side hull lower, it was determined that there was no need to put Panther II into production. It was a heck of a lot easier just to slap the shirts in onto the side. As a result, Panther I continued in production. Had the shirts in failed to provide the required protection, Panther II would have been built. The upper side hull is also four centimeters thick, although this one is angled. You have recovery tools, wire cutters, fire extinguishers, big wooden block, you'd put your jack on this uh, to stop it from sinking too far into the ground. Sledgehammer and of course as you get to the rear of the vehicle, spare track link. So we move to the back of the vehicle. Uh, obviously outboards you got the two very large stowage boxes secured by the standard German army key, uh, key padlock. And it's a similar key you'll see on all sorts of vehicles uh, and padlocks throughout World War II. Moving a bit further inboard, you can see a marker light for convoys. Two exhaust pipes. Now you'll see on some Panthers that there are two more pipes here. These are actually cooling vents for the exhaust manifold. Down underneath, we have various access ports. This is the jack that you would use to change road wheels. As near as I can tell, the outermost access ports are actually for track tension because the idler is, as you can see, on a bell crank and it moves outwards and inwards, as you would expect an idler to do. However, darned if I can actually find out where it is tensioned from, and the manual I have doesn't say. Uh, so I would assume that you would insert a tool, maybe worm gear, a bit like a T-34. Finally, on the outside, you can also have a good look at the thickness of the side plates, four centimeters, both vertical 
and angled on the side. These plates go all the way from the front to the back. So these eyelets are on the same plate of armor metal as the eyelets at the front of the tank. The covers with the hoops on them indicate that underneath the engine deck is the Maybach HL230P30. Let's see if we can open it up. Oh, good Lord, this is heavy. Lift with your legs, not with your back. This really is heavy. <laughs> Look at this. This is a 23 liter water cooled V12, cranks out about 700 horsepower at 3000 RPM. Now, that said, reliability issues led to it having a governor installed, limiting it to 2500 RPM, so in practice, it never really got to that. Still, it was enough to bring it along at a reasonable 55 kilometers an hour before the governor was installed and about 47 afterwards. Fluid capacities, 170 liters of water, 25 liters of motor oil, and 730 liters of fuel, of which about 130 was the reserve. The engine was rated to drink about 3.5 liters per kilometer traveled. Well, that's about it for this. We're gonna close it up and move on. Other items on the back deck, ports for filling, fuel on the right rear, water on the left rear. Two distinctive radiator fans. Of interest, they are not the same type. This is a spiral shape. This one is a more radial one. It was not uncommon to find Panthers produced with a mixture of the two types. Cooling air is be drawn in through the inlets on both sides of the radiator fans. As we move to the rear, the back of the turret is dominated by the loader's hatch. Initially, this was not a primary way of getting in and out of the vehicle. There was no handle for people to hold on to, and it was more of an escape hatch or an access hatch for putting in uh, ammunition into the vehicle without having to lift it all the way up into the turret. It's uh, a relatively complicated system to pull out, but it does lock uh, eventually. to one side and can be held in place by a, a latch. Also while I'm at the back here, I'll take the advantage to talk about the Zimmerit. Uh, it's the anti-magnetic mine paste. Uh, I don't seem to recall that people can exactly remember what goes into it. It's sort of a mix of concrete, zinc, uh, and a few other things. Combined with the rough texture, it's designed to make it very difficult to attach magnetic mines to the vehicle. Now, it turned out that pretty much the only people that use magnetic mines in Europe were the Germans. Uh, so it's a case of protecting against something that wasn't necessary. Combined also with the fact that uh, there were reports coming in that it was an additional fire hazard. In September 44, the German army decided it just wasn't worth putting Zimmer onto the vehicles anymore. And uh, so they ceased using it. Uh, the other thing what I'm talking about here is the color scheme. Uh, most Panthers left the factory dark yellow and the browns and greens were added by units in the field. In September 44 they gave up doing this. They simply left the factory in the red oxide primer and the units in the field were to apply all three colors to their taste once they received the vehicle. The turret roof is relatively sparse. The first thing you'll note is the total lack of a loader's hatch for him to use ordinarily. He's pretty much confined to that one on the back wall. This is the self-defense grenade launcher. Uh, it was installed to replace the pistol ports which had been drilled in the side walls uh, in earlier versions of the vehicle. Forward we have the loader's periscope, his only way of seeing what's going on in the outside world. You'll notice angled off a little bit to the side, which makes a bit of sense since you would expect that the gunner is going to be looking forward anyway. After all, that's where his sight is. And finally forward of it is the ventilator used for the turret ventilation system. Next we're going to have a dive inside the cupola and we'll see what the inside is like. <laughs> 